Have you ever had a time, or maybe I should ask when's the last time, <laughs> because it's pretty common, that you misunderstood something and then you acted out of that misunderstanding and so what you did wasn't right? You know, maybe it was some instructions that you uh, had and you misread them. Uh, the other day I was putting together a bunk bed that we got for my daughter. We got it used, didn't have instructions. So I misunderstood the premise, had to take a couple things apart. Uh, you know, I suppose maybe, you know, parents tell their kids something, the kids misunderstand, or, you know, one example might be wives telling their husbands. Uh, saw a picture on Facebook, uh, a little meme, that said, I told my husband to peel half the potatoes and put them in boiling water, and the picture showed a pot full of potatoes that were half peeled. One half was, one half wasn't, and, the, you know, like, I could probably do something like that. Uh, whatever it is, you misunderstood, and you acted out of that understanding, which was a misunderstanding. So what you did wasn't right, wasn't what was intended by whoever. Well, I think we all understand that our understanding is the key to our actions. As a matter of fact, you might even say it determines our actions. What I understand, well, I act out of that, and so that determines my actions. And so you would think then we would all make a very careful point of always understanding things correctly, right? making sure I know what I should know. But do we? Do we always want to know things the right way? Do we always want to understand things? You might well, I can't think of any time when I wouldn't. Well, I thought of one. My wife has a vacuum cleaner that uh, is one of these ones that uses water in the, in the bottom that filters it through, and so it's more than just flip a switch. And for a while after she got that, I didn't know, I didn't understand how to use it. I wasn't real thrilled when she taught me, <laughs> because up until the time she taught me, guess what? I didn't have to use it. I didn't know how. So I didn't really want to know. I didn't want to understand. Well, do I really, our main thought today, and the question that's going to guide us as we look at this passage in Mark, do I really want to know if I need to change? You know, as believers, if I were to ask you, do you want to change? Do you want to grow and mature? Well, of course I do. That's what I should say. And maybe even some part of me really wants. But do I really want to know specific areas where I need to change? Where I need to be different? Where, where I need to make some change that perhaps is uncomfortable? I like the way things are. I, I don't like the thought of changing. I don't like the thought of that specific change. That's what we're going to see today is this idea of being afraid to ask. Because I don't even really want to know. Again, we're in Mark chapter 9, verse 30. I'll be reading from the ESV. It says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And so Mark is connecting this passage to what we've seen. It really goes beyond chapter 9, this whole idea we've been seeing of a hard heart, a focus on the physical versus the spiritual. But definitely he's connecting it to what we saw the last couple weeks in chapter 9, the transfiguration, where the idea from that was God wants us to get it. He wants us to know what we need to know so we can live out of that. And He'll do everything it takes for us to know. But we have to realize at times when we don't get it. That was the disciples coming down, Jesus and the three, and the disciples at the bottom hadn't been able to cast the demon out of that man's son. And uh, I believe, as I said, it was an action parable of sorts. It really happened, but there was a point there. These disciples were relying on their own ability to understand and didn't realize they weren't understanding. So here was this very obvious physical situation. They relied on their own ability to cast out the demon, and it didn't work. <laughs> so there should have been a lesson there. Hey, guys, it's not working in this area either. And you have the fathers, I believe, help my unbelief. He recognizes something is missing. The disciples didn't. Well, all of that, God wants us to know, but we have to be open to looking, and we'll see sometimes we don't really want to know. Verse 30, They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and He, Jesus, did not want anyone to know, for He was teaching His disciples. So He didn't want the crowds around them. He was focusing on the twelve, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill Him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they, the disciples, did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Now this is the second time Jesus has told the disciples, I am going to be put to death and I am going to rise again. 
Remember the first time he said it, Peter <laughs> rebukes him. No way, won't happen. And Jesus rebukes Peter in front of everyone, so they know that didn't go well. Well, you look at it here, it, one you have to realize when it says that, verse 31, he was teaching his disciples. Well, that has to mean that he did more than just say this one sentence there. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. He didn't just say that once if he was teaching them. He was teaching them about this. And so the point is they had plenty of chances to understand this, to get this. But they still didn't. After however long Jesus spent with them talking about this, they had a chance to understand. They didn't understand. And look what it says. They were afraid to ask. Why were they afraid to ask? Well, I don't know. Again, Peter, when he rebuked Jesus, Jesus came back pretty strong on him. Get behind me, Satan. There's been other times, I don't know if they didn't want to be that, but I do think what happens next is key to it. I think it's going to show us a reason none of them wanted to be the one to ask. And what we're going to see from here, the key verse is verse 32. They did not understand the saying. They didn't understand what Jesus was talking about when He says, I'm going to be killed and rise again. And as a result of that, they didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. And everything we're going to see them do after this, flows out of that misunderstanding. All of their actions are going to become, are come as a result of this misunderstanding of the kingdom. So let's look as this section continues. Verse 33, they came to Capernaum and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now, obviously, they know that really wasn't the thing to be doing because they, they don't just go ahead and say, hey, Jesus, we were doing this. They knew they shouldn't have been doing that. They, they knew it really wasn't the best thing to be doing, but they were doing it, weren't they? They were asking, who is the greatest there? And think about it. I just said they misunderstood the kingdom. You know, Jesus is talking about, I'm the Messiah. They know He's the Messiah. They've acknowledged that. I'm going to be put to death and rise again. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. What was their understanding of the kingdom at this point? I've said several times two things. The big one is it's going to be physical. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to overthrow Rome, set up His kingdom. And then the other side is going to be Jews only. That one gets dealt with a long time later. But here they are. Well, think about it. If your understanding of the kingdom is that Jesus is going to be the king, and here we are, His 12 closest followers, what are they going to be? They're going to be His officials, right? And there's got to be levels of officials. I mean, they, they didn't have presidents and vice presidents, but you can't have 12 vice presidents. So who's the greatest? Who's going to be next below Jesus and below there and where that? No, I'm going to be here. No, I'm going to be here. Their actions totally flew out of, or flowed out of, and even were consistent with their understanding. If it's a physical kingdom, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be discussing it on the way, but it's got to come up sometime. He's got to make these appointments once he kicks out the Romans. Might as well get it settled now. Who's the greatest? I'm going to be the one that gets this position. They acted totally consistently with what they understood. Just like we do. And I also think it gives some insight. Why were they afraid to ask him? They didn't understand. Why were they afraid to ask him? Well, that jeopardized their standing, wouldn't it? Jesus got ready to dole out those positions like, <laughs> that bozo didn't get it when I told him, you know, I'm going to die and rise again. And he, I don't get it, Jesus. No one wanted to be the guy to do that. They were afraid to ask. Didn't want to be seen. Again, because of their understanding, their misunderstanding, it affected their actions, kept them from getting that. Well, verse 35, he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. We know this saying, it's, you know, very common, you, you'll hear it. And so we're familiar with it. But think of how radically opposed this is to the world's idea. Whoever wants to be first must be last. Must be the servant of all. That is so different from the world's way of thinking. We, we need to stop and realize that. And it was so different from what the disciples were thinking at this point. No, they, they had the normal word thing, world's thinking, I want to be first, I need to be aggressive, make my claim to be the greatest. That's how you become first in the world. It is, but it's not how you become first in Jesus' kingdom. And we know that's wrong to try to make your way and be the greatest. 
But how do we act sometimes? Again, we could all probably quote this, but how do we act? Do I live in a way that shows I believe the way to live in Jesus' kingdom is to be the servant of all, not try to be the greatest, not to point out why I am the greatest, deserve to be elevated. Well, Jesus goes on, says in 36, He took a child and put him in the midst of them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now, this is similar to the incident in Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus says, he takes a child, he says, Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest. Here he says, whoever receives this little child. Now, it's not contradicting each other. No doubt Jesus at different occasions said both ideas. And Mark emphasizes this one because it fits his context and what he's talking about. Well, what is he saying? Uh, what's the point? Well, think about it. This idea of receiving, or some translations say welcoming, and all the, uh, in the ancient Near East, the Jews would do to welcome a person, all that they were obligated to do to the point of even risking their life. I mean, they would really go out for someone who they would receive or welcome. Well, what's the personal benefit to doing that for a child? None. What's a child going to get me if I go out of the way to help a child? And so, according to worldly physical thinking, why do it? Not going to benefit me. Not going to get me anything. Now, if it's someone of a, you know, maybe an elevated status, I help them. <laughs> you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. All right, I'll do that. Jesus says, no. If you see no personal benefit, you want the mentality of the kingdom, you want to know who's greatest. It's that humility that would put that child first, that would serve that, someone that you don't see any personal benefit from. And he says there, that type of action is the key not only to receiving me, but to receiving God and the kingdom. This is what it's all about. But again, in light of their misunderstanding, their argument made sense over who's the greatest. Jesus' words were totally out there. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. They didn't want to say that now. They've learned how, how that works out. But that's what they were thinking. That makes no sense, Jesus. Well, look at the next occasion then, verse 38. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water in to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now, before we say what this is saying, we sometimes need to make sure we know what it's not saying. This is not saying that anyone who claims to be of Jesus is of Jesus. You know, one of the most frequent warnings in the New Testament is against false teachers. People who claim, I'm with or of Jesus, here's what you should do, and it's absolutely wrong. So, it's not just anyone says, yeah, hey, I'm with Jesus, trust me, believe me. But you see what Jesus is talking about here. There's this person who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. Now, realize when it says in Jesus' name, and Jesus in verse 39 says, No one who does a mighty work in my name. It's not using Jesus' name as some magic formula. You know, abracadabra, in Jesus' name. In a person's name, it's just like we talk about over and over in the New Testament being in Christ. It's to be in that sphere of who Christ is. It's to have that characterize me. So it's a person whose life was characterized by that. He's acting in accordance with Jesus, with His name, with who He was, His reputation, everything about Him. A person who's doing that, Jesus says, isn't going to just turn around the next minute and be against me. So he's making that point there. Verse 41, he says, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Again, that's not talking about a work salvation. Notice he says, won't lose his reward. That means the person was already a believer. What Jesus is talking about is demonstrating that belief. Well, like James says, faith without works is dead. Just as you see someone doing these things, that shows there's true faith there. Well, again, what's the point here? In context, look at it. This person was casting out demons, but as John says, he was not following us. In other words, he wasn't one of the twelve. He's not one of us, Jesus. Well, maybe not physically. In the counted among the twelve, they certainly was following Jesus, wasn't he? <laughs> In the sense of, he knew who Jesus was to some degree. He was casting out demons in Jesus' name. He was a follower of Jesus. He just wasn't one of them. And think about the context 
They misunderstand the kingdom. It's going to be a physical place. They're jockeying for positions. Well, what if you're worried that out of 12, you're maybe around the 10, 11, 12 mark. Here comes this guy. <laughs> he might push me out of the top 12 even. Like, oh, he's, he's casting out demons in your name, and it's working. And that's the thing there. He's casting out demons. What's that mean? It means a person had demons. This other man is able to cast them out. Well, anyone that has a demon is being oppressed. Their life is being made difficult, miserable to some degree. We saw this boy last time basically had something that looked like epilepsy. It, whoever it was, whatever the situation, whatever the demon did, it wasn't pleasant. A demon never made someone's life better. This person is casting out demons. He's helping a person. He's showing the love of God to that person. And John saying, yeah, we told him to stop that. <laughs> stop helping those people out. He's willing to put... His focus, on the, his focus on the physical is making him put their selfish desires ahead of these people that were being hurt. So by misunderstanding the kingdom, they were acting totally contrary to the kingdom, to God's intention. Our actions flow out of our understanding. And if our understanding is wrong, our actions will be too. Well then, verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. One thing, and we talked about this in Sunday school, uh, it's an indication of the symbolism that's used at times in the Bible. Uh, you know, Jesus talks about hell there. He talks about the fire not being quenched, never goes out, but he also talks about the worm not dying. Well, if a worm is in fire, what's going to happen to the worm? The worm's going to die. So it's to make the point that hell is going to be a bad place. Will it be literal fire? I don't know, but if you imagine being burnt continually, it's worse than that. Can you imagine having a worm eat at you continually? It's worse than that. Whatever it is, the separation from God is worse than we can even imagine. The, the, whatever symbol, image we could come up with. Also, you'll probably notice in your Bibles there that verses 44 and 46 are omitted. Uh, they say the same thing as verse 48, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And it says, you know, some old, most older translations don't have this. There are things like that in the Bible. But as I, I say over and over, they don't affect our understanding. You know, is it affecting our Christian faith if those words really were repeated? <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's the kind of things when people ever come up to you and say, oh, there's all kinds of things in the Bible they're not sure of. Like, yeah, whether that phrase should be repeated once or three times. <laughs> not a real big deal. But what is it talking about here? Uh, verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. So there's that idea again, the little ones that just weren't valued. What can they do for me? What's the big deal? Well, Jesus says, that you cause one of those little ones to sin, here's how seriously God takes it. You'd be better off <laughs> than a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. Well, that's not very good. <laughs> but you'd be better off than how God will treat you. He's trying to get this point across. You, you don't view those as very valuable through your physical mindset. What's the big deal? God views them differently. And then probably the clearest verses in Mark of this overarching theme of a focus on the physical versus the spiritual, our focus that should be on the spiritual versus the physical, this idea of, listen, if your hand causes you to sin, if your foot, if your eye causes you to sin, you know what? Cut them off, gouge it out. You know, we don't really like that thought anyway. I don't want to be without a hand, a foot, or an eye in this day and age, but imagine theirs. They didn't have all the things that help us get along, help us get by. That's how serious it was. And Jesus says, listen, this physical, as serious as that would be in the physical realm, trust me, compared to the spiritual realm, that's where your focus needs to be. It's far more important to keep yourself from sinning. And really, as we've been seeing here, it's far more important to get rid of anything that keeps you from having the right understanding. They were focused on the physical. They wanted a physical kingdom. They wanted to be Jesus officials. They didn't really want to see the truth. 
Jesus is like, get rid. Uh, I don't care how valuable it is to you, how important it is to you. Get rid of it if it's keeping you from doing what you need to do, from understanding what you need to do. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 49 then, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, the context here, salt is good. It says it's right there. And certainly salt would be, in the, in the context there, it's this idea of something that influences, you know, preserves and flavors. And so for us as Christians, it would be really this Christ-like understanding and character and actions. If you had to boil it down, what's salt? Well, it's being like Christ in the world. Being salt is good. Have salt in yourselves, Jesus says. But notice he says how it comes. You're salted with fire. Well, fire are trials. Trials produce salt. At least they, they can. James tells us the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let it have its full effect. So be mature and complete. Paul tells us in Romans that suffering can produce endurance. Endurance, proven character. That's what Jesus is saying. Things will come along to make you salty. Don't lose that, though. Don't lose this. And in, their, in this context, in their situation, by a focus on the wrong thing. You can't make it salty again. And then he ends with, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Well, where'd that come from? Just throws that in? Like, oh yeah, a little tidbit I want to throw in before I end this chapter. No, where did this idea of peace come from? Well, I think it's the key action and the key outcome of being salt. It's the key thing. If I'm to have Christ's character, I'm going to be doing things that lead to peace with others. And if I'm to have Christ's character, those things I'm doing will lead to peace. It's not just direct, it's the result, it's both. And think about it, what we've seen in this context. These people who didn't have Christ's character, didn't have His focus, didn't have His understanding, what did they do? Well, they argued over who was greatest. How much unity is that going to produce? <laughs> I'm better than you. Yeah, try getting along now. And then they see a person, he's not one of us, so we made him stop, Jesus. Disunity. Everything about this. And that unity is so important. But again, their actions made sense for them. If there's a physical kingdom and we're his inner circle, we need to know who's the greatest. We need to keep that guy out. Who knows what kind of uprising he could cause in the kingdom. Their actions made total sense in light of their misunderstanding, but they actually undermined the very nature of the kingdom itself. All right, what about us? What do we get from this? Well, the first thing is this basic principle. Our understanding affects, I think I'd say even determines our actions. I might act contrary to it sometimes, but boy, by and large, it determines my actions. And that is a clear foundational biblical principle. Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world. Don't do what the world does, our actions, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, your understanding. That works both positive and negative. What I understand is going to lead to my actions, good or bad. And so Jesus you know, has been showing them. Paul is telling us there in Romans, you want to change your actions, change your understanding. You know, personally, you think about this. Again, if I want to change my actions, I need to change the way I think about things. Philippians is a great example of this. Paul's talking to these people, and again, he's talking about unity. And what's he explain? What, how's it, what's he help them understand? Humility. Because he knows if you don't have humility, if you don't think of yourself, put yourself below others like Jesus did, you won't be consistently doing things that promote unity. And so, to get them to do the right things, he spends a long time explaining, helping their understanding. You need to know this. I think it's what the whole book of Romans is about. You had the Jews and the Gentile Christians not getting along. So, what does Paul do? He explains grace. Listen, you're looking down on each other because you got yourself up where you don't belong. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need God's grace equally. Get along, people. But he doesn't just start with get along. Explains doctrine, 12 chapters, 11 chapters, certainly 8 chapters, and gets off on a tangent like he's prone to do. <laughs> but that's what it is. And so, at me, I need to understand these things. Just dealing with sin in general. How do you deal with sin in your life? How do you overcome sin? 
You ask most people, how do you do it? Well, you try harder. You do better. You buckle down. You get serious about this sin in your life. Does that work? No. But if that's my understanding of how I deal with sin, that's what I'm going to do. Paul says in Colossians, no, the whole do not taste, do not touch. They sound wise. It makes sense, doesn't it? Well, just don't do it. Work harder at not doing it. <laughs> Try really hard not to do it. That makes sense. He says it sounds wise. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But if that's what I understand, that's what I'm going to do, and it won't work. Same thing as a church-wide focus. Our understanding affects our actions. All right, well, what do we understand? What do we know? You know, if I understand that the ritual surrounding how I serve communion is more important than what communion is and what I get out of it, I'm going to miss the point. I'm going to act out of that misunderstanding. I'm going to be doing something, but not the thing I should be doing. Certainly not the way I should be doing it. How many times have we seen this focus on the physical, and that's really the next thing, a focus on the physical versus the spiritual is our foundational misunderstanding. If you had to really break it down, okay, when we talk about the way I misunderstand, it's because in some way I focus on the physical versus the spiritual. And you remember I said these are like columns, you know, the physical and the spiritual. A uh, focus on this world versus heaven, on the temporary versus the eternal, on me versus God. All of those things in those columns, I, I do them and they go together. That's the foundational misunderstanding. And the thing that can really get us in trouble is a lot of times we can focus on spiritual things in physical ways. As believers, as people who are, took the time to be here, you probably spend a lot of time thinking about spiritual things. So did the disciples. They were thinking about the Messiah and the kingdom all the time, weren't they? And they were thinking about spiritual things in physical ways. Here's the Messiah. He's going to set up His kingdom. What's it going to look like? Well, He's going to throw out those Romans. He's going to put us up as His top officials. Those are very spiritual things in physical ways. The same thing for us. We can think about spiritual things and God and, you know, His Word, but we, in physical ways. You know, under those columns also you have law versus grace, legalism versus grace, works versus faith. And so I can approach this whole Christian life in a very physical way. Very me-centered, man-centered, work-centered way. And one thing we've been seeing about the hard heart, and not even realize it. You think these disciples realized it? No. You know, it seems like they sort of knew, hey, we shouldn't be arguing over who's the greatest, so no one wanted to tell Jesus. But John just spoke right up. <laughs> hey, that guy wasn't for you. We told him to knock it off for following us. We said, knock it off. He didn't know that wasn't right. They haven't known. That's why Jesus has been saying over and over, are you still not getting it? You still don't have understanding. And they're like, oh, we didn't know we didn't know. <laughs> That's one of the key marks of this. And it leads to actions that make sense in light of it. Again, I act out of what I understand. If my misunderstanding is wrong, I'll act the wrong way. I don't even realize my misunderstanding oftentimes is wrong. And then the other thing certainly this passage shows us is that a lack of unity is our foundational resulting actions. Again, what do we see throughout? The disciples arguing. <laughs> Who's the greatest? The disciples is, you're not one of us. The disciples doing anything but being a servant of all. The disciples valuing others, but not, you know, someone who Jesus had to make a point of a child. You know, they, they treat someone important well because, hey, that might benefit me. Everything they did then undermined unity. Everything they did. If we don't get it, the result, the thing that you'll see on the surface, there will be a lack of unity among believers. You know, I thought about this for us and this idea of, you know, whoever welcomes a little child. And for us, it's, it's more than just a little child. I think, how often do you get in the point, and, you know, welcoming might mean just spending some time, you know, giving up some time for a person. You know, whether it's sometime in the day, whether it's meeting for lunch or coffee. How often do you judge it on, well, what can that do for me? That's not going to get me anything. <laughs> I know it's tempting for me sometimes to give up a lunch. Well, who is it? I'm pretty busy. Do you know what? I realized, you know, someone might call me, you know, or, hey, could we get together for lunch? And if my, you know, my initial thought, if it's just, you know, maybe me helping them is, oh, man, I'm really busy. But if there's someone I really want to have lunch with, I clear my calendar like that. You know, someone I thought, wow, that could really get me places. <laughs> All right. Make room. Two, three hours. How long you need for lunch? We're all tempted to that, aren't we? 
And again, that, what's that do then to those other people? They, everything affects our unity. How I treat that other, well, no, I don't have time for you, but they see me do that. It's all about this unity. A lack of unity then destroys the effectiveness of the church. The Lord's Prayer, the true Lord's Prayer in John 17, I do not ask for these only, Jesus praying to the Father, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. Why? So that the world believe you have sent, will believe you have sent me. If we don't have unity, and we try telling the people about the gospel, try telling the people about God and Jesus, why would they believe it? Look at the effect it's having on you. No way. You know, we talk about our personal sins. You know, if I just, you know, blatant sin in my life and I try to witness, well, what about as a group? If I don't have true unity. And what's that look like? I think sometimes we define unity as we don't fight with each other. My wife had this insight recently. She said something about this. And, you know, it's a little bit in Matthew 22. Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's true unity. It's, it's not just I don't fight with you. <laughs> I love you. Well, think about other Christians. Think about other Christians even in this church. And think about if you're married, if my love for my spouse looked like my love for other Christians in the church, how good would my marriage be? Yeah, I don't fight with those people in the church. Well, I don't fight with my wife. I'd help them if they needed it. I'd help my wife if she needs it. Never asked her if she needs it. <laughs> don't know. Don't see her much. You know, I see my wife a couple times a week. See each other a couple times a week. How well do we really love each other? If you just take a standard, you know, all right, what's love? What should it look like? So this idea of unity, again, it's foundational. Disunity is going to totally you know, destroy our witness. But to have a true witness, we've got to have a unity that's more than, hey, we aren't fighting. We truly love each other. We're truly showing love to each other. All right, well, again, the main idea is our understanding determines our actions. The, the central question today has been, do I really want to know if I need to change? <laughs> do I really want to know if my understanding and my actions need to change? And the root problem, I always say there's one, is the answer to that question is sometimes no. I don't want to know if my understanding's wrong because I'll have to change. Sometimes I just don't want to be confronted. I know it's a little on edge when these disciples were arguing over who's the greatest. Again, why didn't they answer when Jesus said, hey, what were you talking about? They knew. He's not going to say, well, that was great. <laughs> they didn't want to be confronted. Sometimes I don't want to be confronted. I know some things are on the edge, but as long as I stay away from that passage there that talks about it, yeah, out of sight, out of mind, right? Or maybe I just don't know. When John said, hey, Jesus, this guy, he's not following us. We told him to stop. I think John, thinking, Jesus is going to pat him on the back. Good job, John. That was great. Thanks for stepping up. <laughs> no, I don't want to find out some of the things I just totally don't know. I don't want my understanding to be different. And so I, I don't really look for things. And how do we grow? I mention all the time the growth triangle. I get into God's word with a truly open mind about what it says versus what I'd like it to say. I look at situations in my life. What's God doing in my life to try to get a point across to me? And I talk with other believers about more than just the weather. I really talk with God's word and situations and we encourage each other in this Christian life. Are you willing to do that and see what might come up? What's the key to overcoming our, our initial uh, perhaps uh, focus to say, no, I don't want to see anything different? Well, it's the idea of saying, God, when I became a follower of you, I signed a blank sheet. I don't get to say, here's what I agree to. I signed my name to a blank sheet. You tell me what it is. And so I need to examine myself. I need an examination of myself, sometimes with other people's help. Okay, <laughs> am I trying to keep some things off that page? And to do all that, the foundation of everything we've been seeing over and over is humility, right? If I'm not humble enough to say there might be something I don't know, I don't care how long I've been at this Christian life, how many church services I've been to, how many times I've read through the Bible, I don't care about any of that. I realize there's some things I may not know. There's some things about myself that don't line up with what they should be. There's some areas of that page that I've kept off limits to God. I want to find out what they are, God. 
Help me do that. Well, last week, we've been talking about this. If this is your, your first time here, we've been talking about this whole idea of a hard heart and not getting it for so long. I'm running out of things to say, here's what it's time to do now, or here's what the root problem is. So last week, I asked you what the root problem was, and we did pretty good at that. Well, guess what? If you look on the handout, what will I do now? There's nothing there. That's because you need to give me some input. We learned that the, the church, the first church, wasn't one guy just talking and everyone listening. There was interaction there. So I'm going to bring in a little interaction. What, what is it? What can we do now? What, just take what we have. What should I do now to help take this principle of sometimes I don't really want to know something different because I'd have to change. I know that shouldn't be the case. I signed up. I committed to a blank sheet. All right. What should we do now to make a step forward here? Ease into it. I suppose that's one way. Isn't that, maybe that's a personality thing. Who likes to ease into change? Who puts their foot in the pool before you jump in? Okay, who just dives in? All right. So I don't know how that would be. I think for some of them, I, I guess the answer might be, how do I best change? How is it? I know I need to. I need to be open to it. What's the best thing going to be? I, I'm an easer in her? Okay. Here's a step. Here's a step. Here's a step. Or <laughs> I'm a jump in the pool. Here's that. So find out what's the best way you change, what helps you change, what hinders you from changing. If maybe the thought of diving in scares you to death, well, okay, then take the step. What else? What do I need to do to take today and make it real? Be honest. Isn't that what we've seen over and over and over? But we all think we're being honest with ourselves. So I can check that one off the list. I'm honest with myself. Who wouldn't be honest with himself? Ask God to help me be honest with myself. Who else might be a good person? What? Leading question. You're not asking him. <laughs> but how may God show you that you're not honest with yourself? Sometimes through someone else, right? Yeah. I remember a, a square that I learned, in, and it has a name in psychology, and we, I learned it in psychology class at Bible college. And uh, it was this idea that, you know, it's, our life's divided into these four quadrants. There's a part of me that I see and everyone sees. You know things about me. You know I'm forgetful. I know I'm forgetful. We all know that about me. You know me well enough. There's a part of me that I see that you don't see. There's some things about me you don't know, even after all this time we spent together. There's some things about me that you know better than I know. And that's why I need to ask some people. There's some things about you see that I'm sort of blocking out. No, I don't see that. I don't want to see that, but you see it. And then there's some things about us that only God sees and we need to ask him and he'll show us. I tell you what, if I really want to examine myself, if I don't ask for some insight from some a trusted Christian who'll be honest with me, speak the truth in love, I don't really want to know. So you got to have someone like that. Anything else? Try to focus on others. What's that? How's that help? So that, in that sense, is doing what he said, and uh, you know, again, that's going to move me to where that's going to open me up to those things. Make a list of what I don't want to <laughs> there you go. Isn't that great? Aren't, we all know some things I, I wouldn't like to, and if nothing else, it opens me up to it, puts those on the table, so God can help me see them better. A little bit like, you know, you pass the billboard every day and you don't notice it until someone says, hey, did you see that billboard of that place or that restaurant? Now I see it all the time, right? Well, make that list. You know, God's been trying to show me, but I haven't. It's not even on my radar, but that'll put it on my radar. What don't I want to change? <laughs> we have the information. We have the information. We have, yeah. Now we have to do something with it, do something with it and sometimes get in and look at it that way. You know, passages that maybe I've seen forever, but if I see them in light of, God, I'm open to changing. Here's the list of things I really don't want to, so I think you probably might tell me. <laughs> I read that passage now. <gasps> Never saw that before. God's like, yeah. <laughs> Been there the whole time. You weren't ready for it. You weren't open to it. You weren't honest with where you were in regard to it. Take this stuff. 
again, it's only a history lesson or a pep talk if we don't do this last thing here and God, what do I need to do to take this and live it out? I want that. Don't you want this? Imagine missing out on everything God has for us, going through life and thinking I've got it, not realizing till the end I don't. What am I missing out on? I don't want to miss out on anything. As much as I don't want to change some things, and maybe that's a mark of maturity, the, the balance is starting to shift to I don't want to change some things, but I don't want to miss out even more. I truly don't, even if it means changing some things that are really uncomfortable. So I'll do what it is, God. Well, we end every service with a time of decision and invitation. And I always say there's the invitation for someone who's never made this commitment to Christ to make it and start the process. There's an invitation for all the rest of us to, all right, take this step we've been talking about today that maybe has you a little nervous. But it's your time to decide whether you decide right there on that mark of maturity or come up and talk to me. Certainly, if you need to make that decision to accept Christ initially, come up and talk to me now or afterward. And whatever it is, don't leave here today the same as when you came in.